By the time this video comes out, hopefully the lockout has ended and the players and owners are singing arm in arm around a freshly signed collective bargaining agreement. But on the off chance that baseball's rogues gallery of elderly billionaire owners hasn't undergone a sudden and unexpected change of heart, odds are one of the main sticking points in the current negotiations is player salary. Fair pay has been an issue at the center of organized baseball since its inception, when the Cincinnati Red Stockings became the first professional team. From the Black Sox scandal to Kurt Flood and Marvin Miller, the economics of Major League Baseball have often found a way into the national spotlight, for better or worse. And while we will be coming back to the current state of MLB wages in a bit, today's video starts off well before the days of collective bargaining and free agency, during the age of barnstorming. When pro athlete salaries are discussed these days, the first things that come to mind for many are sports cars, expensive clothes, and mega mansions. But it wasn't that long ago that all but the very best players in the league brought home pay that wasn't too far off from what the average American made. Go back even farther, and you'll find a time when even the best Major League Baseball players were paid what seems like peanuts compared to today. Adjusted for inflation, Babe Ruth's 1920 salary of $20,000 translates to around $280,000 these days, a far cry from the nine-digit figures the greatest in the game rake in now. What that meant was that many professional players in the early 1900s had to supplement their seasonal income with a second and sometimes even third job. These additional occupations took the form of working in coal mines, driving taxis, and, in the unique case of Honus Wagner, founding a circus. But one of the most common off-season jobs for MLB players was known as barnstorming. From the end of the regular season to the following spring, barnstorming baseball teams across the country would take to the road, staging exhibition matches in cities that otherwise would never get to see professional baseball. For the better players, it was a way to get some practice in during the off-season. But for many, it was an essential part of their yearly income. These games took place in cities from Birmingham to Des Moines and featured Major League stars like Dizzy Dean, Bob Feller, and Lou Gehrig. The games were integrated too, which meant that the best MLB players of their day were playing against Negro League legends like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson, decades before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Robinson himself was a member of the famous barnstorming Indianapolis Clowns before he was signed by the Dodgers. In addition to the all-black Indianapolis squad, some of the most notable barnstorming teams have included the all-women Bloomer Girls, and the main subject of today's video, the House of David. Okay, so I'm gonna get something out of the way from the get-go. By pretty much all definitions, the House of David was a cult. They possessed many of the typical characteristics of a cult, a charismatic leader, communal living, prohibitions on alcohol, apocalyptic beliefs, and, most important to this story at least, a ban on cutting one's hair. So while this video isn't strictly about the House of David as a religious group, do know that this was an organization whose scope extended well beyond the realm of baseball. But when they were playing, the House of David was the most bizarre, bewildering, bearded batch of baseball players anyone at the time, or today for that matter, had ever seen. The Israelite House of David was formed in Benton Harbor, Michigan at the turn of the century. They were an eschatological Christian community, with beliefs largely more radical than those of more orthodox Christians. Their founder, Benjamin Purnell, placed a great deal of emphasis on discipline, both physical and spiritual. Members of the group, which quickly numbered in the hundreds, were strict vegetarians, practiced celibacy outside of marriage, and grew long hair and beards in honor of the Book of Leviticus, which states that the growth of one's hair represents the growth of one's soul. What Purnell also loved was baseball. An avid sports enthusiast, he encouraged his members to play baseball as a way of building spiritual character. A field was built on the commons in 1910, and crowds came not long after. Teams formed and started playing each other within the group initially, but by 1913 they had advanced to such a level that they began playing competitively. Turn ahead the clock to 1920, and the House of David was now barnstorming across the country, traveling from city to city in order to raise money for the colony and preach to local communities. As they made their way between towns, they juggled, put on skits, and performed magic tricks. In this way, the House of David was baseball's answer to the Harlem Globetrotters. Their style of play was marked by aggressive base running, smooth fielding, and skill with the bat. They played pepper before crowds of thousands, often between games, of which they would play two or three per day. 
Beginning in Florida, the House of David would spend the spring, summer, and fall playing over 200 games across the country. As for their record, some estimates place their winning percentage at around 700, or over 140 wins a year. Eventually, the demand grew to the point where the House of David was sending three different baseball teams out at once to tour the country. Revenue from the games went back into the commune, and members took advantage of sellout crowds to pass out religious literature. In an unusual move for the time, they spent the 20s and 30s barnstorming with the Kansas City Monarchs, one of the most renowned Negro League clubs in history. The society members insisted that they and the Monarchs be allowed to eat at the same establishments and sleep in the same hotels, even when it went against local laws. As a result, members of the House of David were able to say what many Major League Baseball players could not. They'd had the opportunity to play against, and with, an enthusiastically bearded Satchel Paige in his prime. Page wasn't the only future Hall of Famer to suit, or beard up, for one of their many teams. Grover Cleveland Alexander, arguably the greatest pitcher of the previous 20 years, not only pitched for the House of David from 1931 to 1935, he also served as the club's manager. In 1928, a 51-year-old Mordecai Three Finger Brown allegedly threw three innings of no-hit ball against the team, striking out all nine batters he faced. Babe Ruth himself made a visit to meet some players in 1934, donning a fake beard as part of a photo shoot. There were even attempts made to sign the Bambino that same year, but officials in the group worried that the Sultan of Swat's love of vice went against everything the House of David stood for. Of course, by the time all this was happening, the House of David was in the process of a full-on collapse. Founder Benjamin Purnell had been convicted of fraud in 1927 and died only a few weeks later. As one might expect, the passing of their messiah had significant consequences for the society, which soon split into several factions among mounting financial and ethical problems. What this also meant was that there were now different iterations of the House of David baseball team, each with varying levels of skill and renown. As the team split in two, confusion grew as to which one was which, a mess which unscrupulous promoters around the country took advantage of, stealing the House of David name for one-off exhibitions and shows. This trend of imitators lasted only a few years, however, after which they were more or less killed off by the Great Depression. Unfortunately, so too was the original House of David team, which ceased its existence in 1936. The second team continued to tour into the 50s, but as the commune declined, so too did its involvement in baseball, and they would eventually play their last ever game in 1955. By this point, barnstorming in general had been on its way out for several decades. The integration of Major League Baseball had more or less killed off the Negro Leagues by the 1960s, while the rise of radio and the advent of television allowed fans to listen to and watch MLB games who couldn't before. These days, little remains of both the House of David and the tradition of barnstorming, at least in the US. One might say that this is a good thing, showing how our best professional baseball players no longer have to risk injury or exhaustion in the offseason in order to stay financially secure. But the truth is that among minor league baseball players, conditions aren't too much better than those of the barnstormers of the early 20th century. In 2021, the majority of minor leaguers made somewhere between eight and $14,000 from April to October, over $12,000 less than the roughly $26,000 a year that MIT has calculated it would take to meet one's basic needs anywhere in the US. Who's to say that if barnstorming leagues were still around, we wouldn't see minor leaguers touring the country on buses for what essentially amounts to spare change? After all, that's basically what they do already, right? One major reason for this discrepancy in pay between MLB and minor league players is the same problem professional players faced a century ago, a lack of collective bargaining power. Whereas players on the 40-man roster receive representation in the form of the MLB Players Association, those who are left off get this. Colin McHugh, for one, believes minor leaguers need to unionize if they're going to stand up for their rights. And if they don't do that, then who knows? Maybe soon you'll be able to see your favorite MOB prospects growing out some gnarly facial hair come wintertime. 